Excuse me, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Morning, uh, Ann Donahue. Um, and I, I want to say at the outset, I, I understand that in terms of my first of three amendments, um, reasonable minds could interpret various ways. It is not my intent in any of these three amendments to in any way uh, restrict um, access to abortion as established in the bill voted on last night. Um, to whatever extent I disagree, I acknowledge and accept that that is, the, that is clearly the will of, um, of the body. Um, I do have three amendments, and the first one, um, I should say this off the record, but you know, it got stolen from me yesterday. <laughs> it's stolen and changed. The, the first one is um, the identical word for word amendment that passed the House, or, or bill that passed the House in 2001. Um, Representative Bancroft presented it yesterday with a significant, I think, a very significant change. And that was a change from notification to consent, to requiring the consent of a parent um, barring a judicial bypass. This um, is the exact wording from 2001, which was a uh, which was on uh, notification. And I think there are a couple of important aspects um, in terms of some of the concerns that were raised on the floor yesterday. Um, first of all, all, all but five states do include um, either notice or consent, um, even those who may have the most expansive laws. I'm assuming everyone has a copy of the amendment. It is in the, uh, it is in the uh, calendar. Um, so I really want to. Which, which amendment is it? This is the first one. This is parental notice. Yeah, yeah. 9.19 a.m. 9.19 a.m. <coughs> it, it's in the. Yes. 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 Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's in the calendar. So. Um, so what I really want to point out is is the kind of the specific provisions um, that were not really. Um, focused on yesterday, um, first of all, it, it only applies to minors who are unemancipated. An emancipated minor is not even, is not included. Um, and um, the, the and, it, and it's notice that has to be provided 24 hours beforehand, um, there's no barrier after 24 hours there's no barrier um, to proceeding regardless of what effect that notice may or may not have. In other words, it doesn't require any consent or any response at all from, from a parent. Um, and there is, there is a, a health exemption if, um, if it need to go forward even before 24 hours. But, but I really want to focus on the judicial bypass because of the concerns um, yesterday. Um, because there, there are a number of really key elements uh, in terms of the um, ease of access, uh, the support in access, and the, the um, speed of the decision-making um, process. So if you look at, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm still getting used to the fact that my eyes now require different glasses <laughs> depending on what I'm looking at. They couldn't put them in one set. Guys are too weird. Um, so, um, in in terms of the process, which uh, if you're looking in the calendar, really begins on page 348. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, so, first of all, this is assisted by. Uh, it's, it's with the help of a provider. This is not a young woman who has to strike out on their own. It's specifically required to be a, a non-traditional um, form. Um, it, the, the court um, is required to provide, trying to find, again, I'm trying to find the language. This will help me be ready for the floor. Um, The petition shall be in a simple form prescribed by rules adopted by the Vermont Supreme Court. So it specifically has to be a simple form, not a, a routine kind of uh, filing. 
Um, the uh, minor is then appointed an attorney and a guardian. The hearing is ex parte, which means doesn't require the presence of the uh, you know, parents or so forth. Um, but also, please notice it's in a setting other than, it may be in a setting other than a traditional courtroom. This is not a situation where it needs to happen um, with all the trappings and intimidating aspects of a courtroom. Uh, it can be held in a very informal setting uh, to be less uh, of a barrier, to be less um, fearful or fear-invoking. And the other really critical thing is about um, concerns about the risk of delay. Court doesn't issue a ruling for a couple of weeks. All of a sudden, we're talking about a, a more risky procedure. There's a three-day default. If the court doesn't issue a ruling within three days, it's automatically granted by virtue of law. Um, and you know the considerations that a court, they, they are a series of or, um, that parental, um, Oh, I just did it the wrong one. Um, there, there is actually, uh, I apologize, we, we um, I'm going to have to have this redrafted because there is an error in, as I'm looking in the calendar, because it goes back to using, under, under the ruling, it goes back to using uh, uh, the relevant factors as parental consent. That is not the intent of this bill, and that needs to be corrected to say parental notification would cause those things. I'm, I, I apologize. I see this in the calendar, and there's the, I'm, I'm giving you the corrected version now. There was a mix-up in our operations, and we've got the wrong one in the calendar. So I'll give you the correct one now. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah, I know. It's been, really been swamped, really right? Hard and right. Long, so. so just Thank so you. everyone's clear, this this is not a consent, and, and all of that's obviously going to be um, corrected. And I think uh, one of the other things that's important to recognize that I just want to reference is the issue of um, evidence of rape or incest, which under existing law, under what's uh, passed, um, there is no protection for a minor where there is that evidence. Um, while, you know, if there's no notice, they, they, there's not that um, perceived or feared obstacle, um, this girl may be going right back home to the same situation, whereas through creating um, some uh, review or opportunity to, to be uh, looking at what's going on, it also requires reporting if, in fact, it turns out that there is evidence of incest or rape. Um, so this is completely focused on um, support and help for a minor. I think um, we probably all recognize in the vast majority of situations that's what's happening anyway. Um, but for those situations where it's not, I think we owe it to um, young women, um, minors under 18, uh, to make sure that, that that is happening. And if it's not happening through um, uh, parents, because um, she's clearly afraid, does not want to uh, have her parents notified, then we have an alternative route to ensure that that support is occurring. Um, there is the additional section, which is about providing um, information and counseling. And, and again, you know, we don't, I don't think any of us want to see a situation where uh, a minor is being uh, pressured by a boyfriend. Um, there are circumstances at home which is uh, which are putting her under pressure, um, and so this is just assuring that there is um, support and uh, and information uh, that for a frightened young girl. Um, may be facing kinds of pressures where this information is not available to her as part of um, what she's thinking about and worried about. So this is focused on being uh, supportive and protective and in every way possible is trying to avoid it being any kind of a barrier uh, instead. Um, well, I think you started to get it a little more just in your, in, um, 
to the last minute or so of what I was going to ask, but I'm I'm I keep hearing you talk about the support and information that the judicial bypass system or the like. What, I'm trying to understand what support is. What is the support that is that this provides? Well, the the support is the notification. Um, Depends for parents to be able to offer that support. Um, I think you know parents have to even parents have to consent for medical records to be released. So if parents aren't involved, um, the provider uh, doesn't even necessarily have access to that. So the, the the intent for support is to bring parents in, but uh, if that's not possible, the intent is to have a very accessible process um, to not need to involve that, then we have the support and information um, also provided through the, uh, the counseling component, which is at the end of the, uh, which is in the section seven of the bill. Um, yesterday, we, I, I appreciate the, the walkthrough. I just asked that we um, are able to hear from the representative of the judiciary. Yeah, we said, yeah. yeah. There were some really yeah. um, excellent points raised yesterday that I don't see whether it's consent or informing would make a difference to the judicial aspect, and that's my concern. Just among I, others, mm -hmm. um, if I can, the purpose of this <coughs> meeting together is for us as two committees to hear the presentation of the amendment and to hear legislative counsel explain. Then in our various areas of expertise, we will divide and conquer. We will divide. <laughs> I'm just using the expression, not the, I'm not attributing any meaning to <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean questions we'll about content. I mean, like that could be the thing. Um, because otherwise, we'll just be having a joint thing. And I, I just had a quick question. Um, so the age of consent in Vermont is 16. I, obviously, I wasn't around when that was created. But the age of consent in Vermont is 16. And if the state feels that a person is mature enough to enter a relationship at the age of 16, how come we're proposing a amendment that they have to be 18 or older to avoid having to notify their parents? Okay, I'm, I'm not sure of the statute you're referencing. The age of consent for any uh, medical procedures in, in Vermont is 18. And so that's what it was based on. Unless, of course, it's an emancipated minor. Questions for me. For, for, for Anne in terms of what it means or what her intent is. Do you have, do you want to have the, yes? I have some quick question. Would parents have to be notified for um, the morning after pill and the pharmaceutical piece as well? As, does this cover? Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. I don't think that. Um, I don't think that under Vermont law those are considered, I mean, that's available at a pharmacy, or if you're talking about that. That's not um, under the statutes for abortion. That's that's a pharmaceutical. There is a medical. There is a medical. There's a different, right, there are two different ones, so. That's a good question about that. Well, we don't know the name of the actual medical abortion. I just want to make sure we're talking about the amendment on parental notification, right? Um, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, okay. so I, I Ex except as as corrected, um, because as in the calendar, it, there are some references to consent, and it is supposed to be notification all the way through, and that's being corrected. Okay. I had I had a question. Uh, oh, it's on your next amendment. 
committees. <clears throat> for the record, Bryn here from Legislative Council. My apologies for that um, for that mix-up. Mike has the correct version of the amendment, and so that should be posted to the website um, pretty soon. And um, the correct version is also then sent to you, Representative Donahue, and um, the clerk. So that should be corrected shortly. Could you the so um, this amendment, as Representative Donahue just indicated, is quite um, similar to the amendment that you looked at yesterday requiring parental notification. Um, it is essentially identical to that amendment, except for that rather than requiring parental notification prior to an abortion, <clears throat> it requires that the, a parent or guardian of an unemancipated minor be notified of the minor's intent to have an abortion. So I'm not sure if the committees would like to go through um, the amendment with the same level of detail that they went through the parental consent version yesterday, or if you'd rather I answer any questions about the amendment. Can you just point out where the differences are? Between the... Between what we saw yesterday. At, sure. They're, they are throughout. So everywhere that um, yesterday, mo almost everywhere that said that required a parent to consent to an abortion, um, that word has been changed to um, requiring the parent, a parent or guardian be notified of the abortion. So that is throughout. I'm not sure I could point out every. Yeah, that's that's okay. Okay. Just about, as far as the procedure itself, uh, the, the, the court may be on such. has that changed at all? Nope. So it still requires that uh, the judicial by bypass procedure is the same. Okay. So the probate court would have um, three days from the time of the filing of a petition for a waiver of the parental notification requirement to um, either grant the petition or not. Um, and the appeal process is the same. So um, if the waiver is not granted, the minor has the right to appeal to the family division. Um, and that family division has to make those same findings based on clear and convincing evidence. Um, and that has to be granted within three days and it's the same, it provides for the same procedure. So if the petition is not granted within three days or the, the petition is not ruled upon within three days, it's automatically granted. And only the minor can seek to extend that time frame. And then is the, um, the counseling um, provision? Is the different? counseling provision is also here. Yeah. And that is also the same. Okay. <laughs> Sure. And, yeah. Um, Bryn, is the, um, in yesterday's bill there was an appeal provision? Is that the same essentially? That is the same, yes. That is the same here as it was in the consent requirement amendment. And does that, um, does that also state that if there's not a decision within it does. a period of time that it's automatic? That's right. So within three, if the, if the family division hasn't issued a ruling on the position within three days, then it's an automatic grant of the waiver of the notification requirement, unless um, the minor has requested an extension, okay. and then it's automatically at the end of that extended period. difference in terms of the notification of some consent in terms of who can appeal. So I'm a parent and I just been notified that my child has asked going to have an abortion. Right. So can I um, right, so appeal, appeal the decision of the court? So there's that there's still that provision um, uh, which is the same as it was in the consent requirement amendment that limits any appeals to an order author so an order authorizing an abortion without the notification requirement is not subject to an appeal it's only if the court denies the petition that that a minor can appeal 
So the parent can only appeal if the court has said no. Right. right, that's right. But uh, presumably they wouldn't if they had already been notified. But yes, that's accurate. Brim, I see all the time constraints are based on after the letter has been, or the notification has been personally delivered. Is there any allowance for if delivery is not uh, available or is not possible? Or does that create an instance of appeal or is that recognized in the corporate proceedings? Um, I see that it provides that it ha the notification has to either be personally delivered or sent by certified mail with return receipt requested and the time of the delivery um, is deemed to occur at the time the return receipt is signed by the recipient. So are you, so are you um, asking if, for example, it was returned without delivery receipt? Yes. I don't believe that there is a procedure set out for um, what would happen in those circumstances, but I would imagine a minor might be able to request an extension at the time period. Um, a question around potential timeline for the, the way the law is now, what's Potentially, what's the shortest amount of time uh, before uh, a minor could have an abortion if you know if they went to their, their doctor, clinic, hospital, or whatever, uh, the way it is now, and, and with this, and, uh, and and I guess uh, the way it is now, the longest uh, amount of time before the procedure could happen, and the same questions if, if this was. Right, so currently we don't have a um, statutory requirement that a minor seek notific parental notification prior to having an abortion. So presumably right now a minor could go um, to a health care provider and receive an abortion the same day. And so this would, this would uh, add an additional at least, at least three days um, to that process, assuming that the minor um, filed a petition and the court granted the waiver within three days. It could potentially be longer if the if the court denies the petition, um, or if the minor requests an extension. Oh, I was just going to ask about kind of the upper limits. So the, it could be longer, would be more it, like a couple weeks, right? I mean, yeah, math I mean, right? yes, depending on how long it takes the minor to to access the probate court, um, and if the waiver is denied and the minor has to petition the family division on an appeal, um, that may take some additional time. So yes, it could add weeks, days or weeks to the process. Um, and even say that the minor has talked to their parents, but under today, they would talk to their parents, make a decision, go in, see the physician, be able to have the abortion. If they, now, under this, what kind of proof would they have to present to say that their parents, so they have to, could they just bring a sheet or does their parent have to do something as an active role for their parent? Right, so it prohibits, so the abortion provider would have to, um, upon a minor presenting uh, herself to a clinic or to a facility, um, the provider would not be able to provide that abortion until um, notice was sent to a parent. So it requires written notification delivered to at least one parent. A written notification would be by certified mail. Right, or personal delivery. So you have to, it would have to be mailed. You couldn't hand it to the, to the woman and have her bring it home, get it signed, and bring it back in. It have to be mailed and then mailed back to the provider? Um, no, I don't think it would have to be mailed back. It would just, the time of delivery would be the time the return receipt was signed by the recipient. I'm, I'm, I apologize if I don't, if I'm not getting my mail terminology right. But I believe that doesn't, I believe you can get a, I'm sorry. So I just want to note that under, under um, 5297, the, the, the notice is not required at all if the parent or guardian who's entitled to notice certifies that they've been notified. 
So if, if a minor comes in with a note, note from the parent saying, I've been notified, um, they don't need to mail or have the provider give it. Uh, that, that section, 5297-2, is an exemption to the notification that's required. And that's if the parent or guardian who's entitled to notice certifies uh, with their identity that they've been notified. So that could be same day. That, that does not require mail or personal delivery by the, by the provider. So certifies, would you like, make a copy of their license and sign a piece of paper and send it back? I mean, I just was trying to think of how much on onus is on the parent to make sure that the physician knows that it was the parent. No, not when it's sent. I mean, yes, if, if it's happening on the initiative of the parent to verify, as opposed to it being mailed by the provider. If the parent is, you know, coming in that day, um, then the parent needs to certify in writing and give proof of, uh, proof of their identity. So, yes, that would be on the parent to verify they've been notified if it's going to happen without any of the required mail or um, certification by the provider as providing it. So what happens uh, when the minor is in the care and custody of the state, like foster care? Or has not been? So, um, as long as a, as long as the minor is not emancipated or um, the minor has not had a guardian appointed, um, my understanding is that the requirement would stand um, that either either a guardian who's been appointed for that minor or a parent of the minor be notified. So it would be the state, right? So it would be the Department of Children and Families would be the guardian. It's not, a, not, it doesn't require a court appointed guardian. It's whoever is the guardian, which would be either the parent or the state if they have custody. Right, the guardian who's entitled. It gets a little complicated in the, that gray zone for time. Can I follow up to represent Christie's question? Because I believe there are certain medical procedures when, when a child or youth is in the custody of the Department for Children and Families that require court permission to perform um, absent this. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out if there's any conflict between that requirement and this requirement. Okay. I would have to look into that. Okay. Into those procedures. I don't know what those are. Because that was the question. both committees. Um, this amendment begins on page 353 uh, of today's calendar. And to me, the critical thing here is that um, unlike the, you know, the codification of existing law in terms of um, reproductive rights and abortion, um, we are also codifying recognition of the fundamental right as a fundamental right to choose to carry a pregnancy to term or to give birth to a child. And recognizing a right without um, giving protection against that right being infringed upon is not much of a right. The bill goes on in terms of protecting the right to have an abortion by saying it cannot be denied, restricted, or infringed upon by a governmental entity. Um, however, um, 
a mother who wants to bring her child to term, who wants to give birth, um, does not have any protection against external actors who might have um, either reckless or um, homicidal intentions, shooting someone. Um, I, I think it's important to note that this is a very narrowly drafted. Can you just slow down so can I make sure I sure. understand? Um, can you repeat what you just said? Um, a mom who wants to bring the pregnancy to term. Or give birth, right? Yeah. Uh, it is not is not protected against the actions of someone who wants to um, interfere with that fundamental right um, by by uh, doing something that would be a criminal act otherwise um, against someone else. This is narrowly crafted uh, because it's creating a definition that just simply goes into, reflects in any other aspects of uh, criminal law that protect individuals. In this case, it narrowly expands that definition of a victim of a homicide or a negligently caused death um, to a viable fetus. And I think, I mean, there was a lot of good discussion on the floor yesterday about sort of the vagueness of what, what does viable fetus uh, mean. Um, and this bases it upon um, both uh, medical, I, we heard the member from Jericho talk yesterday about, um, you know, 20 weeks is when a death certificate is, is required to be filed. Um, this bases it on uh, medical information and actually uses the language defining uh, viability, viable fetus, uh, the same way that New Hampshire law does for the same, um, the same statute. Um, so it's, it is very specific. Um, that would obviously be an element of proof in a case that would be brought. Um, there are other states that uh, do not use that narrower definition that are much, much broader. People may have heard about statutes like that. That is not uh, what this is. Um, so, yeah. What is this modeled after? Well, the, the, the statute itself is modeled after the bill that was introduced in the Senate a few years ago. But the language that goes further and defines, because uh, the Senate just said a viable fetus, the, the definition of a viable fetus is taken from New Hampshire, New Hampshire law. Um, 30 other, th this isn't a new idea that's being brought to the floor. 38 other states have such laws. As I referenced, some, some are much broader. Uh, some do not restrict it to a, a viable fetus. Um, but I think that's basically, um, you know, if we're, if we're passing a statute which identifies this as a fundamental right, I think it's the right time to also address this issue, which has been around in the state house for quite a while now. Um, basically it. Question over here. Oh, sorry. Um, Representative Donahue, um, so you said narrowly defined. It looks like it's particularly pertaining to operation of a motor vehicle. No? No. Okay. It's, it's, in, it's inserted anywhere in law where um, it is, uh, uh, let me just, uh, it's, it's, it's added there, but in terms of, um, if you see in section, section 3B, prosecution may be maintained for a violation of section 2301, which is murder, 2304, manslaughter, and then there's the additional um, clarity around motor vehicle. Okay. So it covers any um, any homicide. Or... So just a clarification around motor vehicle. Um, uh, actually, line 17. So in the case we have under the influence of, and I see four drugs, and because we've done so much work on testing of cannabis, I'm just thinking of a scenario. I'd be curious what your thoughts are. Let's suppose that you're um, receiving medicinal marijuana, 
And we don't, as we know, have tests for impairment. We have tests for presence of. And you're pregnant and you're driving and uh, someone runs a red light and slams into your car. How would you, and the, there's a death resulting, how would that under this amendment be treated? It would be treated exactly matching what would happen under current law, but it's it simply, I guess a way to think about it is if there was a passenger in that car that you're referencing who died as a result, the law as it exists currently, there's no change in the underlying motor vehicle law, um, would apply. This attributes a, a viable fetus as basically a passenger in the vehicle. fetus is considered a person under the homicide statutes so um, and it provides for an explicit carve out for any acts that are performed during a lawful abortion um, or pursuant to any usual or customary standards of medical practice during diagnostic testing or therapeutic treatment or to acts that are committed um, by a pregnant person towards that person's own viable fetus so that's for the purposes of the homicide statute and then, as she mentioned, it adds um, some additional language to the grossly negligent operation statute and the DUI statute that provides that um, a prosecution can be maintained for either grossly negligent operation or DUI with death resulting um, when the violation results in the death of a viable fetus. interpretation of a fetus in the, in, for all kinds of other? Well, as we talked about before, courts are very reluctant to expand the scope of criminal statutes um, beyond what is in the plain language. So I think what's intended here, these are criminal statutes, is to make it very clear that a person, um, for the purposes of these statutes, includes a viable fetus. I don't necessarily think that it would lead a court to um, interpret any other criminal statutes more broadly that do not make that specific provision that a person could, could constitute a, a viable fetus. I, I just uh, would reference in support of, of that the specific language, the first words in the amendment as used in this section. So this definition is apl applies only to this section. D shall not be construed to confer, deny, expand, or contract the legal status or legal rights of a viable fetus. So it really tries to make it incredibly explicit. Question over here. Yeah, I, I, I'm. I'm understanding what you're saying, but um, the other thing that is also running through my mind is whether um, uh, a parent, um, a parent of a, a child now who um, is, has a death resulting of that child due to potential uh, neglect uh, or accused neglect, um, could that and that let's say that parent is is charged with manslaughter could that also apply to a fetus 
in this situation, let's just say the parent had poor nutrition or something like that. I mean, are, are, is, is I think for the if you're if you're referring to that first section mm -hmm. about the homicide statute, I think that that language um, clarifying that it doesn't apply to acts committed by a pregnant person towards the own towards the person's own it's viable okay. fetus um, would exclude. Okay, that conduct. So I apologize if I miss this, but we heard um, from Representative Till yesterday that there were rare occasions that people have um, a, an abortion after the 20th week for uh, great danger to the mother or the situation with the, fe the fetus being very unlikely to have a regular lifespan, etc. Would this make it a criminal act for someone to, because it's talking about a um, abortion pursuant to usual and customary standards. But I'm wondering if the 20th week is meaning if one were performed in the 21st week, if that's going to be considered criminal. I don't think so because um, that carve out in section C says that it shall not apply to acts performed during an abortion. So I think that excludes all abortion related care or pursuant to usual and customary standards of medical practice during diagnostic testing or therapeutic treatment. So am I not worried about a kind of setting some little carve out around C? I think that because that language in C says that this section shall not apply <coughs> to acts performed during an abortion, I don't think it's going to have the effect of criminalizing um, abortion after 20 weeks. But let's say the um, victim, the fetus victim, happens to be a, um, a fetal demise, and the person has not had either um, a miscarriage yet or something else. Would a fetal demise count as? As somebody, as a victim, would the person be charged with the crime if it does say viable? So I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe they're yeah. right. So it's because it pins it to that viability um, benchmark. Or are, are you referring to um, a fetal demise prior to that viability benchmark? Mm -hmm. I would say I don't think so because it appears to set that line in the sand for when the section shall apply. It is after 20 weeks. So prior to that, I don't think it would apply. But no. after that, okay. it would it be okay. yeah. Yes, okay. to the extent that it's that carve out. I, I think mine might be something along the lines of what you're talking about, but so I, I think that the definition of viable in here is uh, clear as to this section, but supposing, say, after the 20th week that the fetus was, was dead, but you still had the uh, you know, a car accident or something, would they say, well, it was dead beforehand, so, or would they be able to tell Good, that's a good question. <laughs> I'm not. I'm. Um, I'm not sure how that would work. Um, if the if the fetus was already dead, I'm not sure how they would. They would. They would. Know, the prosecutor would know that, um, except based on the testimony of the of the pregnant person. Mm. But, but I don't know if I'm, that's answering your question. 
I, I just seemed like a sticky. Well, it's, um, um, so, and, and we have to, yeah, it's just just it. a reminder that for any kind of criminal prosecution, it's the burden of the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. So if the actions did not result in the death of the fetus because the fetus had already was already deceased. Um, last amendment, which is on page uh, 354 of today's calendar, I think it's really helpful to see the language uh, directly in context of the existing intent language, because it does not remove any existing intent language. Um, so, uh, so I made that. I made enough for both committee members. I apologize, I didn't make enough for everyone in the room, but um, so pass them around. It's large print because I need the large print in my class. So as standard drafting, it, it underlines uh, the new proposed language. As you'll note, there is, there is no strike out of any of the existing language. Um, so, you know, to me, this really goes to the heart of this entire debate, and, and I would suggest, uh, regrettably, it's, it's not really a debate. Um, from uh, most of each of the sides, um, there is a lack of recognition of any validity of the other perspective. So most folks who identify as being pro-life say this is about the life of a human person and therefore it should always take precedence. On the other side, this is about the right of privacy of a woman to make her own reproduction, reproductive dis decisions and there is no acknowledgement of any other interests. So I think, you know, the, the pro-life side doesn't recognize that this is not the same as any other life, you know, walking around on Earth or whatever. I mean, this, is, this is a developing life inside the womb of a mother and attached to the mother. That makes the issue different. And on the other side, this is not a cluster of cancer cells. There is an interest here. And I actually think it was perhaps best stated by the Vermont, by the U.S. Supreme Court um, in the Doe v. Roe v. Wade decision, sorry, um, which said the pregnant woman cannot be isolated in her privacy. She carries an embryo and later a fetus. So this is discussion applying to all stages of pregnancy. The situation, therefore, is inherently different from marriage, procreation, the other rights of privacy that the court acknowledged. The woman's privacy is no longer sold. But, the court went on to say, but the, the state's interest in that developing potential life is not compelling until potentially in the last trimester the state can assert a compelling interest. It's not automatic. The state cannot assert that the interest is compelling until the third trimester. And in Vermont, we have asserted it is, we, we are not finding it compelling. We are finding the right to privacy as the compelling interest through all three phases of pregnancy. But I think if we're ever going to get to honest discussion about these interests, we have to acknowledge that they do exist. Society does have an interest in the fact that the woman's privacy is no longer the sole interest at stake when we are weighing these interests. So 
I made an effort in this proposed intent language, and it's only intent. It doesn't carry other impl impl uh, implications of their intent. I did not use the word person. In fact, I used the term the, the begins the development of a genetically distinct human life. I think that's, I, I don't think there would be a disagreement that that's scientifically accurate. So it's simply stating that we recognize that that fertilization begins the development of a genetically distinct human life. However, however, it prioritizes the individual's choice to decide whether to sustain that life in utero. This is a fundamental issue for a woman. They are being making the decision about sustaining or not sustaining what is happening in their own body. And therefore, the General Assembly intends this act to safeguard that existing right. And I specify access to abortion and reproductive health services because calling them only reproductive health services does eliminate the reality that abortion is not just reproductive health services. It is not the sole issue in an abortion. by saying, yeah, the, the court may look to it, and it makes it really explicit what the General Assembly's intent is, and that is the decision to prioritize that individual's choice and the intent to safeguard the existing rights to access abortion or reproductive health services. So it... Thank you. This may be an unfair question. If we put something like this in there, would you then support uh, each 57? No, I don't think it's an unfair question. Um, I, I think that um, for myself, um, I would not, I would not necessarily make the decision to prioritize every aspect of what H57 says over. Um, the other interests. However, what I'm saying is I do I recognize that that is the will of the General Assembly. Um, and so I am suggesting that we frame that intent um, in what the what the real issue is. But but I would not end up in the same balance necessarily or since, it's it's a much more complicated. I mean, I, I mean we could talk. Yeah. Okay. We can hear. Um, thank you, Anne. We can hear proper amendment. We don't have. Yeah. 
for the record. Um, this amendment, um, after listening to, to the last three, this one's going to be easier. This simply allows abortion to take place throughout the entire pregnancy if the fetus is not viable or the abortion is necessary to protect a woman's health or life. Health is defined as both physical and mental. This amendment also allows abortion to take place unrestricted up to the first 24 weeks from the commencement of the pregnancy. It's been stated that the purpose of this bill is to codify what's allowed now in Vermont <coughs> in terms of abortion. I believe this amendment does it. We heard the good doctor, the representative from Jericho yesterday, say that abortions after 20 weeks are very rare. This one's unrestricted for 24. He described in detail mm -hmm. the conditions that have to be met and verified by the healthcare provider before the abortion after 20 weeks is performed. So I say again, this men amendment does codify what the practice is in Vermont now. That's what we want to do. It allows for unrestricted abortion up through 24 weeks, and it allows the abortion to take place when the fetus is not viable, and it protects a woman's life and health. It also allows those difficult decisions concerning abortion to be made by the woman and her health care provider and anyone else that she chooses to be part of that decision-making process. So I believe this amendment reflects and codifies the common practice in Vermont, and I ask that you support it. So quick questions, because the Judiciary Committee has, um, does have witnesses here. We all have to get them right now. Yeah, the, the, so, um, Barbara, please. Can you say what this, what the purpose of this amendment is? Like, I'm a little To qualify confused. what's existing in Vermont now so, in terms of abortion. So if I want to have an abortion now, I don't have to have a conversation with my health care provider by in my first few weeks that I'm doing it because of a physical or mental health concern. This provides <coughs> unrestricted abortion for the first 24 weeks. And then it's for, me for mental health or physical issues physical after health, Physical health, weeks. viability of the fetus. After 24 weeks. No, during those 24 weeks too. So if I have an adjustment disorder, I have to, I mean, I have to go and make a, get a mental health diagnosis of adjustment disorder or something in order to have a valid reason? It provides, it, it's, it's unrestricted for the first 24 weeks. You don't have to do anything. It's not restricted. I mean, it's not restricted up through 24. And then it's the viability of the fetus 
the health of the mother, which is defined as mental and physical. But that's the route to time. If in the first 24 weeks, if you wanted to say um, th th there's a mental issue, then you can you can do that. It's just. I need, I need bread. <coughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, Jack. It's all right. Um, to preserve the life or physical mental health of the patient in this amendment will solely rest with the medical provider. It's mm -hmm. up to the provider's professional judgment based on the facts of the patient's case. Right. Can you repeat that? So it's the determination turns on the provider's professional judgment as it is based on the facts of the patient's individual case. Um, so in that situation, situ uh, example I used the other day but, uh, from a story that I got was about a, a, a couple that, that were pregnant in, in late late term. It was, if I remember right, it was in eight months they discovered the baby had spina bifida. Pregnant, pregnant. Um, an abortion later in pregnancy. Late term abortion is. <laughs> Um, so what would happen in that case where um, would it be the, just the personal opinion of the provider at that point for that couple? About whether or not that fetus was viable? Right, well, whether, I mean, now or uh, with the bill that's being proposed, they could, uh, you know, they could choose to, to have an abortion. Right, so this would subject a provider to unprofessional conduct discipline if the provider provided an abortion um, under circumstances that go beyond what are, what are listed in A. So if the provider finds that the fetus is viable, in other words, would survive outside the womb, um, then the provider would be prohibited from providing an abortion unless he or she found that um, the patient's life or physical or mental health um, would be at risk and therefore the abortion is necessary. So, so it would be a viable fetus, so they would be able to work as well. Okay. So just to follow on that line of thinking, there could conceivably could be a situation where um, a doctor and patient have different views on whether uh, the fetus is viable. That is conceivable. So, so can you doctor shop? I mean, is that going to be what happens? I would, I would imagine that yes, you could. if you found yes, you yeah, that some providers may be unwilling under certain circumstances right, because they would be concerned about being subject to professional conduct <coughs> violations and maybe another doctor would be more comfortable and not as concerned. Yeah, but could, you wouldn't be able to abort the fetus because it would be viable outside the womb in any case, right? That's right. I, I think the, the other piece of it is a provider can provide an abortion at any point if that provider thinks that the abortion would be necessary to preserve the life or health of the patient. And when you're talking about health, it specifically says the physical or mental health of the mm -hmm. patient. <laughs> um, Brenda, we have other um, uh, instances where the legislature tells the medical practice board what shall con shall constitute unprofessional conduct. Um, I 
I'm not aware of any, but I would like to confirm that. But I'm not aware of any. Get back to us if we agree. I'll get back to the community about that, yeah. Um, last amendment is represented Bancroft, uh, and it is around mandatory counseling, which I'm sure you all in the judiciary find very interesting, but um, we're going to go upstairs <laughs> while you hear from our witnesses. <laughs>
if the court fails to rule within three business days of receiving the petition or fails to rule by the expiration of any extension, and remember it's only the child that can ask for the extension, the petition is granted. A certified copy of the automatic waiver of parental consent shall be delivered. I, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that document is. Obviously, the court hasn't entered its decision, and that's why the petition is granted by default. There isn't any document emanating from, from the court at that point. decision, again, assuming the resources that are not there, assuming the time frame, if they had this hearing, and if you look again at the, the matters they have to consider in order to issue that order, the court has to make findings on each and every one of those um, issues before it, and I, I think it was Representative Donovan who mentioned you know, whether the child was being pressured by uh, boyfriend, one way or another. There's really no way of knowing that if the only person before you is, is the child. Um, and the same may be that the, you don't know what, why the parent has to know. You don't know whether the parent supports abortion, doesn't know about it. Um, so I, I have the same concern yesterday. Nothing has changed. So we'll we'll just let the default decision ride, right, or would there be more of a compulsion to if, have to meet? The if I said compelled, it's because the legislation says we're right. supposed to set precedent. Right. But right. what I was trying to say, and maybe not, uh, well, you did not say it well. I mean, we already have uh, a statute that basically says juvenile matters have right. to take a priority. Right. Right. Um, so this obviously is in probate court, so it wouldn't interfere with that. But. Um, if the probate court is not in session on a particular day in order to meet these requirements, we would be asking the other courts. I mean, the probate courts sit in county courts most of them. And I'll use an example. The, the court down the street is the civil division, but it also houses the probate division. They have certain days set aside for probate matters, and the rest of the time the court is being used in the courtrooms are being used for civil matters. Um, they, this time frame would require them to set aside other matters um, in another division. Um, I mean, that's what the statute calls for. Whether or not the court could do it on that short of notice is the real question. For the most part, our dockets, our schedules are set out two months in advance at a minimum, so uh, it, it, it would complicate it. I don't know that we could meet this requirement, uh, particularly in some of those smaller courts. Um, and, smaller courts. and to be clear, the, I don't think you said um, that the courts would be compelled. I think that was my, just my language, interpreting what you said. I, I think the statute calls for that. Yeah. I don't know that we could ever, ever meet that, with what the statute calls for. I, guess, I think I was responding to hearing the presenter of the amendment sort of, um, I don't want to 
put words in their mouth, but sort of say, like, it's okay, it's okay, it's no big deal if, um, well, you know, there's a provision for that. It will just, it will just be decided by default. So it's not really this question of the courts being well, unable to keep up with it is a non-issue. That's the way that the decision is made. Um, I think it's a poor way to make a decision on, on something as important as this. I don't see that as a as a viable option for the issues that this this is by default. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. And um, I don't think we need anyone. I think I can simplify it by saying, for instance, um, on, on the amendment that talks about uh, 13 VSA 2312, one of Representative Donahue's amendments, the caption I had is viable fetus treatment victim. And I, I listened to the discussion when that was being, discussion was being discussed. <laughs> because the court, and I think some of the witnesses said it, the court would have to interpret this uh, at some point in the process. I would not uh, certainly offer my opinion on this at this time. I mean, it's, it's something that could clearly come before the court, and I would not feel it was appropriate. Um, to do so on that piece. The other one um, was on the legislative intent, and all I can say is that, and again, one of the witnesses mentioned that the court sometimes will consider this. You know, you have 32 trial judges, and some of them may look at it, may consider it. So if it's there, they may consider it. But sure. So I'm glad you, I was curious about the, the intent one, because it does seem like it's putting a stake in the ground saying that the fertilization of the human egg begins at the, I mean, it's, it's staking. So, so when you're saying the courts will look at it, they're going to they're gonna look at everything that we're putting out there, like it's making a value judgment that we're no, I'm, I'm saying you could have this in, in statute. I, I would not offer an opinion on the language that's here, but what I would want the committee to understand is even if it's included in the bill, because it's legislative intent, that doesn't mean that every time this issue comes before the court that an individual could necessarily access this. Right. I would, I would they hope would. they would. Yes. But I can't, I, I wouldn't want to Thank you. It's, it's important, obviously, and it's helpful, but um, it's not. But if it doesn't exist, then we're going to have to look at it. doesn't exist, then we right. don't have yeah. to right. worry about whether someone will benefit. Okay. Great. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's going to be a joint effort. Okay, great. Thank you. I'll, I'll move back after I'm full. Yeah, yeah. So for the record, Joshua Diamond, Deputy Attorney General. I'm here today by Assistant Attorney Deputy General Um I'd just like to make a preliminary statement about the amendments and then also go over to the further comment. Um, as the general General Donovan testified uh, previously before this committee. We support, the Attorney General's office supports unequivocally H-57 without the amendments because it does something very important. It codifies current practice and the status of Vermont law where there are no legal restrictions upon women's right to access abortion. And that decision fundamentally resides between the woman and her medical provider. These amendments are inconsistent with that intent and purpose of the law, and therefore we oppose them. And with that, I will turn it over to Assistant Attorney General David Sheriff for further comment. Thank you. And um, I will just briefly run through the amendments that we've seen this morning and describe. So actually, I'm sorry. Um, Judge, you were talking quickly. Can you um, restate what you would? Well, or if you can just send this Or if you have it, do you have it? I don't have it typed up, but I'm happy to shoot you an email. That would be great. Okay. 
Okay. And I'll just briefly run through each of the amendments that we've seen this morning and describe the ways in which they defeat the purpose of page 57 um, by making changes to the current law, which is not the object and, and not what the attorney general is for. Looking at parental notification first, um, presently, if the you know, access to abortion access to reproductive health care is a decision that resides between uh, a pregnant woman and her health care provider, this is clearly a significant alteration for that and a significant alteration to the mom's statute. Looking at the viable fetus amendment, this would directly overturn Vermont Supreme Court precedent. That's Supreme Court precedent of Stavey Oliver. We talked a little bit about that yesterday. That's a decision from 1989 stating that there is not criminal liability uh, with regards to the death of a fetus. This is, as I said, a um, direct overturning of that holding. And you can't just yeah. say that case one more time. It is State v. Oliver. And that's a Vermont. Vermont Supreme Court case. Are you moving on? I was, but go please. <laughs> so that, that is true. The legislature um, is like, yeah, so desires for case. Why shouldn't it? As Deputy Diamond expressed, we believe that this bill, the purpose of this bill, is to codify the current state of Vermont law and not to change it and this defeats that purpose. I got that. Any other reason? I mean, I'd like, I'd like to understand, you know, so as far as, I, I, get, I get that and I agree with that. But, um, so if you could comment on how the law currently addresses, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> how the law currently addresses the situation that this amendment is trying to make. The law currently addresses the situation by making criminal any act that would be criminal under this amendment. Yeah, obviously, the current law would have different victims, but I don't think that you can present a hypothetical in which an injury that would be encompassed by this act would not already be a crime. I think it would be extremely difficult to think of any hypothetical that would present that case. So, for example, um, it's hard to imagine how a murder or manslaughter, as applied to a viable fetus, would not also be, at the very least, an aggravated assault against um, a pregnant woman. Uh, and could you comment on? Uh the definition of viable fetus and whether that would present any issues for prosecutors? Certainly, I think when it comes to proving beyond a reasonable doubt, whether you, as defined in this subsection A, I think it would be a significant challenge to prove beyond a reasonable doubt the, or it may be a significant challenge to prove beyond a reasonable doubt the timing of conception. At time of conception, and I mean, is there any? If it is, is it does it matter if uh, this definition has picked a particular time of 20 weeks, and we're going to call that viability? And I understand that it's hard to tell when 20 weeks has happened because you don't know when conception is. But is there any other? Is there any other kind of issue that comes up that we're establishing 20 weeks? Uh, and whether the uh, fetus is viable at 20 weeks can vary, is my understanding. Or, I, or, or, or is it fine that you say 20 weeks and we have this set and there's enough rationale for being 20 weeks as long as we can understand when conception occurred? I would say the medical rationale for choosing 20 weeks is well outside of my area okay, of fine. expertise, and another witness would probably be better. But is it well outside of our role to legislate? It is absolutely the case that by legislating about the definition of viability, you are significant. You're going significantly beyond what Vermont law currently does. Can you say more about that? Well, 
if I may, uh, Madam Chair, the current law, and I believe the intent of this legislation of H57 is to leave that decision fundamentally between a patient and her health care provider. By defining viability, you are removing that parad paradigm, if you will, of decision making, which I think, um, as identified earlier, would be unique to Vermont law. Uh, I think as the general had reflected, he's not aware of any procedure that would receive similar types of regulations or restrictions upon a man, and therefore um, to do so for a woman would just be, um, would be wrong. Does that raise constitutional concerns? I, I believe, I believe. The Vermont Constitution? It, it would seem that it would raise equal protection questions. Common benefits or, uh... Concepts of equal protection. Uh, identified by the common benefits clause, but also ready for the Oh, yeah. I'm not so sure I am. Is that, is yeah, that no. with respect to the amendment we're looking at right now and the definition of viability? I think whenever you treat genders differently, you raise a question potentially of equal protection. And certainly, given the fact that Vermont law does not, as I understand it, restrict medical procedures on men. To do so for a woman, I think, raises questions of the concept of equal protection as recognized through the common benefits. So what I'm confused about is this amendment is dealing with if you can charge, but you're saying that that will then carry over into other issues because in State v. Oliver, it wasn't about a woman's right to choose. It was about, is this 34-week-old fetus being treated as a person in terms of charging a crime against them? I'd like to just bring it up another 10,000 feet. OK. I, I, I think, again, we support H57 at the Attorney General's office because it codifies the current practice in law that there are no restrictions on abortion. We think that is important. Um, it's grounded in the concepts of equal protection as well as personal privacy. And um, anything that would change that, which we think these amendments and this one in particular does, chips away, okay. chips away at that. And State v. Oliver was considered a good, solid decision. It's because, again, like back to our right to make changes, it's not like, oh my gosh, we found this awful loophole in the law. It sounds like there were lots of other citations from State v. Oliver that 30 other cases in other states also <coughs> were similarly. Um, yes, State yeah. v. Oliver was decided in 1989. It's been long standing precedent here in the state of Vermont for more than 30 years or about 30 years. Uh, and there hasn't been reason to revisit that, as I understand it. So, what would be um, the impact of overturning it? Yesterday, David, you spoke to Seattle just various um, unintended consequences or um, more testimony needed, uh, really thinking how this would impact courts, DCF. Um, do you have some other concerns here? I think in complete candor, this is more narrowly drafted than the personhood amendment we were looking at yesterday. Some of the concerns around the effects on DCF, on family court proceedings, on parentage proceedings are not implicated by this. Um, that's a quick answer. Um, you also mentioned that um, that these um, charges are already covered elsewhere in, in law. So then, you know, somebody might say we don't need, I mean, I don't want to put words up. So given that, are you saying that we don't need this? Yes, I don't think that public safety requires the addition of these laws, that, that the public is adequately protected by the laws that are on the books. Supreme Court case, the PPN and the, the right. AI. Yeah. 
Um, there is a little bit of a medical exception clause here that I think is, um, I'm sorry, I just should have a little more prepared to, to ask you this question. Yeah, my own page too, that's the page thing, I think. Yes, okay, yeah, I did mark it in the calendar, but not that. Um, on page two, yes, limitations. Um, so, so have you, do you think that, um, does that satisfy the requirements for that That's a good clause, question. We were or trying, is there a question? This morning, um, we were trying to do quick research on this, and we don't have a definitive answer, okay. to be honest. We okay. believe that on an initial glance, it certainly seems to address the um, constitutional concern. However, to know if it does it, we would really have to look through parental notification decisions and understand what the courts have decided is a sufficient right. carve out. And I couldn't tell you right now whether this is a sufficient carve out as decided by the line of court cases addressing parental notification. I think we would need more time and research yeah. mm -hmm. in um, immigration agencies. Right. Okay. <sighs> it's like the sausage making. Okay. Uh, what was this, what, I don't know if we talked about this yet, but the uh, uh, bill on intent of the bill, what was the um, issue that you had with that? Sure. So specifically the issue with that is that no United States Supreme Court case has recognized any legal significance to the moment of fertilization. So this would be a significant change to the state of the law. As uh, legislative counsel has mentioned, that can affect court decision making, even if it's not as a body of the statute when, uh, when courts are trying to ascertain legislative intent. And we do think that is making a significant change beyond the uh, current state of law on this issue. But if it wasn't being tied on to this bill, would you be interested in it? Certainly. So, no, no United States Supreme Court case has attached any legal significance to the moment of fertilization. Doing so in this legislative intent piece would be a significant change in the state of the law, and. As legislative counsel mentioned, that can have an effect on how laws are interpreted when judges are trying to understand what was meant by legislative action. Sorry, we need another floor. Real quick, Dr. Till did touch on that yesterday. I don't know what the explanation was, but around doing life. Hey, you saw right. when money starts. Right. Right. Not, not you, if you. Uh, 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 right, right. yes, yes. yes. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And the other yeah. 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 right. yeah. 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 He's, he's a good person for providing that. Yeah. 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 I think we're going to. Uh, Chloe, what do you you? I, I imagine, I think you were, were you wanting testimony on all? on you know all the ones that you all will be dealing with okay great, great. or whatever i have to offer i think you did um get some uh i did and it should be on your desk and that's what i'm pulling up right now so uh again i introduced myself uh so i thank you for having me um and for all your work on this we we strongly oppose all these amendments offered today and urge you to find them unfavorable. Um, again, as, as the Attorney General's office said, uh, the intent of the bill is to codify what's already legal in Vermont, and all these amendments would undermine that intent. Um, so I, I wanted to speak specifically to the fetal victim amendment and the parental notification amendment. So um, on the fetal victim amendment, um, there are several concerns. First, um, despite what Section D set claims, which says that it doesn't give uh, independent rights to the fetus, uh, we uh, it shall not be construed to confer, or deny, expand, or contract the legal status or legal rights of a viable fetus. Um, we find that that it does, in fact, it confer independent rights on the fetus. Um, 
because it because there is a there will be a separate crime for the for causing the death of a fetus. Um, and second, and I think most significant, um, Section C says this amendment shall not apply to acts committed by a pregnant person toward the person's own viable fetus. So the word toward um, implies to me an intentional act geared toward the fetus. So an act that um, a pregnant person would, would do specifically aimed at causing harm to the fetus. So it, it is plausible to me um, that, for instance, a woman who is in a car accident um, and not wearing a seatbelt and who subsequently lost the pregnancy could be charged with grossly negligent operation of a motor vehicle with death resulting or manslaughter for the death of their own fetus. Um, compounding the trauma and grief that a woman losing a wanted pregnancy would, would feel. Um, in another example, if a woman attempted to commit suicide but was unsuccessful, uh, yet lost her pregnancy as a result of the attempt, it's conceivable she could be charged with manslaughter or homicide. Um, uh, someone dealing with suicide probably, um, you know, as we've talked about uh, the public health approach here, maybe more need of, of mental health counseling and health rather than being charged with manslaughter or homicide. And, and this is precisely what's actually happened in, uh, in Indiana in 2011 to Baby Shui who was a Chinese immigrant um, and uh, served many months in prison um, before being released and charged with a lesser crime. So you can tell me what um, the case was? Sure, this is, uh, there's a woman named Baby Shui in, in Indiana. She attempted to commit suicide by ingesting rat poison. Uh, she had recently been broken up with the, by the father of her uh, unborn fetus. Uh, she survived, but the fetus did not, and she was charged with uh, with man with uh, with homicide, um, and uh, was jailed during the uh, during the length of her trial, and was eventually convinced to seek a plea deal where she agreed, pled guilty to criminal recklessness. Um, she was prior, prior to her. Prior to the right. She was detained. Right. Exactly. Um, uh, you know, this is it's contrary to a lot of what we talked about here about uh, public health and, and the response, proper response uh, to to someone experiencing those sorts of issues. Um, there have been others where um, a woman has given birth to a, uh, or excuse me, a woman has been. Uh, Utilize, you know, is, is substance has substance use disorder. Um, her fetus has perished and has been charged with with murder because of the death of the fetus. Again, it's it's really because the implication of this is that it's, if there's an intentional act geared toward the fetus, um, but if there's not, it seems like there's plenty of space for someone to be charged with murder, despite not with no intent to murder a fetus. Um, and in speaking, you know, and I, I had this thought after after writing this testimony as well, you know, adding this, usually when you when you have a statute and you need a scientist or you need the mens rea to the intent to commit a uh, commit an act, there is no by adding this and let me by adding viable fetus. The victim of a homicide is a viable fetus. Um, someone could be prosecuted for murder or manslaughter. But I, I, I would encourage you to look at, you know, is there the requisite mens rea or scienter in there? Because will there be an intent to cause the end of the pregnancy, um, which is separate from causing uh, violence to the pa to care the person, the carrier of the pregnancy? Um, so I think it's worth it's worth an examination of, of what is this ch what kind of change does this enact to the the mens rea inherent in the murder our murder and manslaughter statutes. Um, and, yes, please, sir. Yeah, and uh, I'm just trying to um, certainly in you know, there there may be times where um, a person didn't even know that. Right. So yeah. Uh, right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it, so so I, I would urge an examination of that. Um, 
I, I do want to say also regarding the parental notification amendment, I, I think um, you know, we're, I was really affected by Judge Gerson's testimony regarding the feasibility of the process. Um, I would also note that the amendment treats pregnant people differently on the basis of their decisions regarding their pregnancies. So um, Representative Donahue was talking about how her amendment uh, was necessary to ensure that there was parental support um, and, and parental care involved, unless, of course, there were exceptions and why you go through the judicial bypass. Um, but, what, but the same uh, notification requirement would not apply to a teenager who would want to continue their pregnancy, but would not want to inform their parents for whatever reason. Um, so treating people differently on the basis of, of, of their decision. Um, and the amendment also wouldn't apply to a teenager, for instance, who wished to seek a vasectomy. Um, so that, that could be, you know, one to look at that as unequal treatment of, of these teenagers on the basis of sex. Uh, you know, uh, so that, I think that, that's, that's also a concern. I think if, if one is saying that this amendment is, is geared toward the, uh, the ensuring that there's parental support around decisions around pregnancy and around, uh, around the ability to, uh, around reproductive ability, I think that it's it's rather unequal treatment. Um, so that those are those are my concerns with that fall under your jurisdiction with these amendments. And I'm happy as always to answer any questions or respond to concerns. Yeah, also I know in terms of the um viable fetus amendment um, the attorney general's office also um, expressed concerns about I, you know, I, I, ha I wasn't able to look into that, but I, I think they were, I, I think you're right, it, you know, it is, I think it would bring up some concerns, but I, I just haven't had the opportunity to uh, investigate that, and nor really has, has the committee, unfortunately. Right. So I'm, I guess I'd love to hear how much this type of legislation, while well, on the face of it you could see situations where people might say, oh gosh, you know, a scenario could be presented that could be theoretically well intended. Thank you very much. I guess I just wonder about, like, does it open the door for the precedent for fetal rights? Uh, the, the fetal victim amendment? I think absolutely. It, it, again, it, it, you know, this is sort of standing in a way, or I, I, I mean, to an extent, um, possibly. I mean, we, I mean, I think it is. You know, it says that it's not intended to uh, endow, uh, confer, deny, expand, or contract the legal status or legal rights of a viable fetus, but it, it in fact, it does because previously the legal the fetus there was no response. There is no. Uh, crime for when the victim of a homicide is a viable fetus, as it says in Section B, and so this does expand that legal status and the legal rights. It's just not, um, I, I mean, notwithstanding Section D, it absolutely does expand those that legal status and rights. Um, and it's it's another way to uh, toward fetal personhood. As I think, as as. Uh, the assistant attorney general said, I mean, it is more narrowly construed than, than yesterday's fetal personhood amendment, but it, it still does confer this, this uh, personhood onto, onto a fetus.
personal notification. Um, do we have any similar uh, process required for um, medical procedures that are just specific to boys and men? Um, that would require um, notification. No, not that I'm aware of. So a um, so a teenage boy could um, have a vasectomy without notification. And I'm trying to think of what other um, circumcision. I don't know. I'm trying to think. Right. Um, mm -hmm. No, I not that I am aware of. Do we have any similar process for any medical treatment? Any other medical treatment? So um, could that that raise um, common benefits for um, constitutional claims and equal protection? Yes, I mean, I, I heard the testimony um, that um, Chloe just gave, and I agree that I think it's possible that there could um, be an equal protection issue or a common benefits issue under the Constitution for a, a, a specific um, requirement that, um, by its very nature, can only be imposed on a, a female and not a male. Yeah. So <clears throat> along that, that line, uh, when I asked the question about uh, the minor in care of the state, mm -hmm. uh, uh, with that part of the process, um, I mean, we, we heard from uh, Judge Grierson that uh, timing it, of just the process with the court is, is crazy, right. and, and it just doesn't... Uh, <clears throat> it doesn't fit a normal constraint. You know, it, it's not like it can't happen, but it's going to take time. Right. So, in a situation where uh, a child is in foster care and they're under the care and custody of the state, mm -hmm. you know, until 18, and in some cases longer, that that process of decision making. Uh, is, is shared now by the state of Vermont. Right, that's right. Okay, and I can certainly see in that kind of situation there may be a concern that the timing would be even more prolonged in a situation where a person is in the care or custody of the state. So, Kevin. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, Coach, were you saying that um, Someone in foster care would have to get permission from the state? Yeah. Okay. It, it, because there is a procedure. There is a procedure right now for, for any kind of medical intervention right. that, a, that a minor might need, right. you know, has to be agreed upon, you know, by... But not get permission to do it at home. parents do have certain uh, requirements that, you know, emergency, emergency safety, you know, uh, situations, but there's still that uh, due notification component as a foster parent, you know, back to the state, you know, we're on our way to the emergency room, so-and-so, you know, that kind of thing. Um, year or two, within the last year or two, we relaxed some rules or laws around foster parents. I, I don't remember what it was all about, but I do remember yeah, we did it. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it just comes to mind is maybe this is certainly not something to deal with in this bill, but mm -hmm. um, maybe something to look at in the future. That's <laughs> Um, so one other thing I would add is that um, Article 7, the Common Benefits Clause in the Vermont Constitution has been interpreted more broadly um, than the U.S. Constitution, so it may be that it confers more benefits um, to the individual citizens of Vermont than, than the actual United States Constitution. So I would say that Article 7 is generally more protective than the Equal, equal Protection Clause. means 
So how, how would that apply to this amendment? So just in, you know, just to back up what I said and what Chloe said earlier about um, about the potential uh, that amendment has to infringe upon the constitutional right. I don't think it's a question that the court has looked at, so I can't give you um, direct jurisprudence about it, but um, but I think it's helpful to know that the, that the Common Benefits Clause is widely regarded as more protective than the U.S. Constitution. More protective of privacy. Yeah, more protective of individual rights. Mm -hmm. Supreme Court case with the which um, kind of hinged on the emergency carve out. And it's okay if you don't. Your answer is just the um, same. Like we would need to do more work. A lot more work on said, it. Test, we had heard just from the AG. Yeah, there might be some constitutional concerns with the well, about whether or not that would be considered an undue burden. Um, Yes, I think the question is: Can you is is the um, emergency carve out sufficient? Carve out sufficient? Right. I would I would like to look at that before I comment on it. Okay, I'll look at that case. Let me know. regarding establishment of religion, First Amendment um, concerns. Um, and to me, this feels like a more appropriate for a, you know, a religious discussion, a philosophical discussion. Um, um, I'm not sure whether or not it's appropriate for us to legislate when life begins. Um, so that's one concern. Um, I, I think the testimony was that the U.S. Supreme Court has hasn't ever determined that, or <clears throat> right whether whether legislative intent um, can be considered by a court in, ter in interpreting a statute. I think that what we were talking about was when when uh, when a court will undergo a consideration of legislative intent. But no, but also in terms of um, mechanism in the Attorney General's office. But I think he was talking about you know a court actually determining when life begins and if this if there was a question about this legislative intent, I mean is that the type of thing that legislatures you know dive into and courts. Right. Right. I just I do I don't think it I think it's a I, I understand the concern about um, infringing upon um, <coughs> the right to freedom of religion with an amendment like this. Um, that could be a concern. I think it's a legitimate concern. And then the other thing is, um, maybe it's just, just me, but when I read it, I, I feel like, like maybe they're conflicting, or is it, is it clear? Um, and again, if the court were to look at it, you know, like first we're saying this is what we recognize, this is when life begins, um, but then we intend to safeguard the existing access to abortion. Um, I just I don't know. Are, are they in conflict? And then and then how does that impact um, H fifty seven if we're to pass? Because my understanding is that um, the representative Donahue would want this to be part of H fifty seven as it stands right now, mm -hmm. having passed um, you know on the floor so far, right? Well, I can I can understand that concern, especially since um, this committee has thought so much about the Beecham case, 
um, which found that the statute criminalizing abortion um, yielded sort of an illogical result by um, providing that an individual had the right to have an abortion, but then criminalized a provider for providing <coughs> an abortion. So I can understand why you'd be focusing on sort of the, um, the nature of this amendment as saying two things at once. Um, so I guess I would just comment on um, on how courts use a le legislative intent in interpreting a statute. Um, so typically courts use the plain meaning rule when they interpret a statute, meaning um, if the meaning is plain from the text of the statute, the court doesn't need to look elsewhere to decide what the statute means. Um, but if the court finds the statute to be uh, ambiguous, like a word or a phrase in the statute to be ambiguous, then the court will look to rules of statutory construction. And there are lots of those rules. And um, one of them is that the court can look at any legislative intent that was set forth with the legislation. Um, so there, what that means is that a court can um, construe the legislative intent section to give a particular meaning to a word or a phrase in a statute. Um, so if the court undertook an analysis of the, of the first part of that amendment, that the General Assembly recognizes that the fertilization of a human egg begins the development of a distinct human life, um, it may ascribe meaning to the statute, um, to H57, based on that legislative intent. Um, and the second phrase of the sentence, that the General Assembly prioritizes an, an individual's choice, uh, may or may not influence the court's interpretation. Um, so in other words, courts can find ambiguity in some places and not in other places. It's sort of sometimes the court will find ambiguity in order to um, base, base its decision on what it, think it believes to be a fair outcome, in other words. Um, so I think by recognizing, um, by the General Assembly setting out legislative intent that it recognizes that life begins with conception, um, could potentially have an implication for how the court um, interpreted H57, in particular the, that first purpose and policy section where it talks about the fundamental right of a person to um, choose to have an abortion. So, for example, the court could look to that acknowledgment of the legislature that life begins at, at conception and then disregard the second part of that sentence um, by finding that a legislature can't find that life begins at conception and then simultaneously prefer, prefer reproductive choice. Um, and I'm not suggesting that a court would do this. I'm just saying this is how in, um, courts, courts use legislative intent in their interpretation of the statute. So can you say that again? Sure. So, um, and, and let's you can actually look at the languages here. So the, and I'm looking at um, where she um, yeah. and gave it where um, this where we actually have the whole thing. Like if it were to pass, what would it look like? The current approach does not restrict the right to an option. The General Assembly recognizes the relation of the of human egg. Right. Yeah. Um, um, for, so that that would be somebody establishing that. Mm -hmm. okay. Right, and then and then the second part of her sentence um, is, but the general assembly prioritizes an individual's choice to decide whether to sustain life. Um, sorry, I don't have I don't have her and then Thank you. So are you saying that the court might stop for? I, I think yeah. that what I'm what I'm trying to say is that a court can, um, if a court finds something ambiguous, it can choose to look to legislative intent, and it based on what it finds to be ambiguous, the court can look at pieces of the legislative intent and disregard other pieces. Um, so, I think my understanding is that the concern might be that a court could look at that at that first <coughs> phrase of the sentence that life the General Assembly finds that life begins at conception. And then say, if this, if the court, if the general assembly is finding that life begins at conception, it may disregard the second part of that sentence and find that if life begins at conception, that life deserves protection under the Constitution, and the legislature can't, um, therefore, prioritize uh, reproductive choice over the life of a over a living person. 
so it pretty much could, could gut the whole thing. I yeah, know an interpretation of a, of a court could could say, wait a minute, no, well, you know, um, what is it, we're, you know, a public entity, all, you know, could it, I mean, could there be, could there be a cause of action ever then, I mean, this? Well, I, I guess what I, I, could there be a cause of action under H-57 if, if we, if we had this language and the court, let's say, was to interpret and, you know, stop that, you know, it's our, this is our right, it seems in conflict with, with the underlying mm -hmm. bill and, um, yeah, I do. I do see how that how the language does seem to be in conflict with the rest of the bill. <clears throat> and I could, and I would just say it's not inconceivable that a court could look to that language and find that if life begins at conception, that should ascri um, ascribe personhood status to a fetus. Again, that would be the court's decision, mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying that that would happen, but. Um, potential outcome. See, that was the interesting point that uh, Judge Grierson brought up, you know, having, you know, 12 judges and all possibly interpreting it a little differently because there's not always consistency in interpretation. So by having such a big opening, you're opening up the possibility for more <laughs> Uh, varied interpretations. So. Right, and I think what one judge may find ambiguous, another judge may not find ambiguous. So, and then you move on from the, to the rules of statutory construction from there. So, um, so am I correct in hearing that, that that this could lead to an interpretation undermining? H-57 and the protections therein. I think it's possible. And that, um, and that there also could be um, First Amendment concerns. more of a statement than a question, but this makes me incredibly uncomfortable because it is I mean, there's incredible debate among lawyers, philosophers, like everybody, about when life begins. And for us to declare when life begins seems, but I, I don't see it. I just, I find that difficult. And one thing I just, just, I just discovered, which I didn't know, is in Judaism, um, life does not begin, it's not recognized to begin until birth. Which is again, you know, I, when you talk about First Amendment stuff and religion, it just seems like it's important to not make religious assumptions for people. When the morning after pill is considered contraception, right? Yes, yes, okay. because it's designed to prevent fertilization. Okay, with this, if. If we determine when an egg is fertilized um, and somebody takes a morning after pill and the egg is fertilized, is there any ramifications there? Morning. Well, again, I would just say that it, you know, just because we're setting it out in legislative intent, it doesn't have any immediate ramification, I don't think. But um, I do think it's legitimate to point out that if a court were to interpret this legislative and interpret age 57 in a way, um, that imbued meaning to the legislative intent, I think it's possible it could have an impact on a person's ability to take the morning after pill. Right, yeah, to me, it, it seems like, I mean, I didn't know how long it took an, an egg to be fertilized, and it can be as little as 30 minutes. And so with this language, the, I, I mean, not that I'm a lawyer, but I would interpret that morning after pill becomes an abortion. But.
fetal homicide. Um, actually, I'll start with, um, so again, here we would be putting 20th week in the in law. Um, do we, I mean, again, this is science, this is medicine, it's changing. It's, um, do we tend to talk about um, sort of medical <coughs> practice in this way? No, so I did, um, reach out to some of my colleagues that specialize in health care law to find, to sort of think about whether or not we prohibit a medical procedure based on the timing of that procedure anywhere else in statute. And they couldn't think of any other examples. The one that I found is that the, in the patient um, choice at end of life statute, um, patient choice is only available to a person um, with a terminal condition. And a terminal condition is defined as an incurable and irreversible disease, which would, in reasonable medical judgment, result in death within six months. So you have to be with, in a provider's um, medical judgment within six months from death to have access to um, a prescription that would end your life. Um, but that is the only example that we could come up with of a place where, and it's also different because it's, a, it's, a, it's not a procedure, it's a treatment to end a person's life. And also that applies to men. And that applies and equally. And is accessible to men and women. That's right. So here we're talking about a medical procedure, talking about, um, and this goes back to the question of, um, I think this is where the age talked about the common benefits clause, that we are inserting law to a you know, um, procedure that. Apply equally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I couldn't find any other instance of a, a medical procedure that is limited based on time. Mm -hmm. um, there was one question, there was something I heard yesterday that I want to clarify, or verify rather. If, in, in order for a person to be the victim of a homicide or manslaughter, they have to be born alive. Right. What, what is that specific? What, what does that come from? Is there that comes from case law. Um, it's a, the State versus Oliver case. I think it's a 1980 Vermont Supreme Court case. Actually, it might be 1989. Um, that found that for purposes of the criminal statutes, um, in order to be considered a person for under a criminal statute, you must be born alive. And we talked about that in committee a little bit. That's um, historically the prevailing common law view. Um, some states have set out fetal personhood for purposes of the criminal statutes. So some states have moved away from that prevailing common law, but that is from the time of the 17th century, the, um, the historical common law view that you had to be born alive in order to be um, considered a person under the criminal code. So this would overturn? It would. It would yeah. overturn. Okay. And so, so even though it's more narrow, and what we talked about yesterday that still could have implications. I, mean, I just don't know. I would need to hear from prosecutors and others. Yes. I mean, I think it, it, as, as the presenter of the amendment said, that it does say, as used in this section, a viable fetus is this. But as we just talked about, a court, um, if it finds ambiguity in a statute, it can go to the rules of statutory construction. And again, I said, I, I, I'll just say again that the, there are lots of rules of statutory construction. So a, a court can look at how the legislature has legislated in other areas of the criminal code. Um, so again, courts are very reluctant to expand the scope of a criminal statute without express intent of the legislature. Um, but I think it's possible that a court could look at this statute and say, this is what um, personhood means, and apply it to other places. Sorry, yeah. Aren't we worried about putting the issues related to abortion aside, getting in the middle of legislating medical treatment? Yeah, that's for upstairs, but yes, I mean that, yeah. Again, we should be found yeah. questions for appropriate, but yeah. So thinking about, you know, our purview and <coughs> the variables that come into play, you know, if we broaden the scope, you know, of the existing bill, we're almost creating an environment that could 
what well, well not even thinking about a crystal ball it's just it it could throw it, everything you know like out of whack so to speak i mean if the courts are used to you know looking at the legislation as is and the definition as is it is the purview of the legislature to change things but when we do if we don't look at the unintended consequence of the change it can have incredible ramifications, I think, on, on this personhood component, especially. Um, I, yeah, I see, I, I think our, I'm interpreting what you're saying to mean by overturning an established um, rule by the Supreme Court that a person has to be born alive for purposes of the criminal statute, so that could um, render some instability in the way that courts look at our criminal code. And um, this time when we're concerned about incarceration, we potentially could have a lot more women incarcerated in this facility that we're currently looking at it and asking our other committee, asking whether or not it really needs to meet some more women offenders. <coughs> So, I mean, there, there is potential for incarceration in there, right? And yeah. Yes, the grossly negligent operation. Oh, yes, yeah. in general, yes. Under the, set, the second part, the grossly negligent operation and the DUI statute, I don't think that there would be anything that would prohibit a, a pregnant woman from being prosecuted for the death of her own fetus in those circumstances. So but even under B, right? Even under yeah. right. I just think that the first section, the um, homicide section, is it does have that specific carve out for a person who undertook action, acts committed by a pregnant person towards her own viable fetus. Mm -hmm. So there's the carve out in the in the homicide statutes, but not in the um, negligent operation or DUI statute. Again, actually. Sorry. Because we're not really. Well, right, so, the, yeah. so the way the amendment is set up is that the um, fetal personhood, for purposes of the homicide statute, um, can't apply to acts taken by a pregnant person against their own viable fetus. And where's that? That's in subsection C. <coughs> Section shall not apply to acts performed during an abor abortion. And then there on lines 15 and 16, or to acts committed by a pregnant person towards that person's own viable fetus. But there is, is there potential to, um, that we're not sure if this means intentional um, or, or not? So um, yes, I think that the, as it's written, it's not, it's, I don't think it's entirely clear what the mens rea is for a homicide um, upon a fetus. But I think what the point I was making is that in section four and five, the grossly negligent operation and the DUI, there's not that same carve out. So that a person could conceivably, a pregnant person could conceivably be prosecuted um, under those two statutes if the person drove in a grossly negligent fashion resulting in the death of her own fetus, or if she were convicted of a DUI with fetal death resulting. So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm just saying that that carve out doesn't apply to those other two sessions. So, and again, do we have? I mean, we have person smoking in the car with the child. We, I mean, again, this is um, this is targeting, right? We're criminal. I mean, basically, we're criminalizing potential behavior, women's behavior. Behavior. Yeah. I think. Which. Um, well. Do we do that. Okay. Yeah, that, I mean that's I can't I can't think of another place that that we that we that a statute could only apply to a person who is a born a woman, I suppose. You know, and just to take it to another crazy level, so we have women skiers, and they're one of the best in the world if not the best. So let's say she's pregnant and she hits a gate and 
you know, the father, you know, goes to the prosecutor. I, I know this is... No, I'm but, just thinking she's going to go to Ireland to protest. But, that's right. but, yeah, sorry. but you know, it's, it's a situation, like, like you said, that is targeting one protected mm -hmm. class, you know? I don't know. Right, there, that, it's conceivable that the, that the father could have a, have a civil action against her currently mm -hmm. under the Valen Court decision that finds that wrongful death versus um, can recover for wrongful death the fetus. Um, but that's a civil, yeah. a civil action. But, but if you got a prosecutor that, that said, well, you just should have known better because you're a prominent figure, and why would you do that? You know, I, 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 I just people are weird, you know, and so just taking that into account, it's hard to say, you know, where somebody could go with that. Right. I mean, think about all the miscarriages that people have, or it's going to start being questioned, like, well, yeah, what did it, you do to right, cause that's your miscarriage? I mean. Right. <clears throat> right. It's like. Are those that? So I'd feel reluctant to speculate on without the without the full circumstances, um, all of the facts of the scenario. Which is good. Any other questions on? If we have more time, I'll keep it close. Thank you.